On August 20th, I received the Canon R5 Mark II. That's just a little over three months ago. So nonstop, five to six days a week, shooting with this professionally, coming from the R6 II. What are my thoughts? Well, spoiler alert, they're pretty awesome. I have a lot to say about it. And so this is my three month review on the R5 II. Welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here, my name is Jared Hoyman, an architectural photographer here in Northeast Wisconsin. And I not only like to do little tutorials and comparisons of gear and showing, you know, Canon cameras and Canon lenses and third party lenses, I like to nerd out on things. So you're in the right place if you like to nerd out as well. So I've been shooting with the Canon R5 Mark II for the last three plus months. And I have to say, coming from the Canon R6 Mark II, I wasn't sure because I love 24 megapixels. I love managing that smaller size, especially with all the shoots that I do each day. So going to 45 megapixels, I wasn't sure if I was going to like it or not, but holy crap, I totally love 45 megapixels. Is it too much? No, it is, it is great. I have cropped in, I've done detail shots in some of my clients' uh, businesses and I'm able to take those shots and it's almost like having an APS-C camera with me on the go. So this is gonna be a broad overview of my personal experience over the last three months on this camera, how I've been using it and how maybe you might use it if you are looking at getting the R5 II. So I'm a notes guy. I'm gonna go in here and kind of refresh my memory a little bit on what makes this camera so special for me. So I do wanna hit on the video aspects of it. Now I did a lot of videos about video with the Canon R5 II, almost said the R6 II, but on the R5 II, and I haven't done enough photography uh, videos yet. I will be. That's why this is not a full, full review. It's just a three month review. Probably at six months to a year, that's where you'll get a bigger review on this. But let's just talk about what I've been doing so far. Now on the physical end of things, I do want to kind of show you this is all souped up. Now recently I did do a video explaining the fan grip and how I've been using it uh, in the brief amount of time that I've had it. You know, it's only been a little over a week and a half or so with this, but I absolutely love it. It is better than I thought it was gonna be. And then I've had this for quite a while since the R7. So the R7 and the R6 II has used the Tascam XLR 2D, which uses the digital hot shoe on top of these cameras and the R5 II is no exception. So it gives you digital connection to the XLR um, right here and then you can monitor as well. This has definitely come down in price. I think originally it was $400, now it's less than 300. Um, and if you're into video production and you have an R7, R6 II, R3, R5 II, R1, uh, these are much needed. I'm thinking that the R8 has the same digital hot shoe. I'm not 100% sure, but it might. This is good. By the way, the things I'm talking about today are going to be in the links below. So if you are looking at purchasing these, it's no extra cost to you if you use those links and it does help support the channel. So outside of the battery grip and the XLR 2D by Tascam, those are the only things that make this thing really bulky. But let me do this. I'm going to strip it down to just the R5 II. Okay, now it's all stripped down. So here is the battery grip slash the cooling fan. And here is the Tascam XLR 2D. So are they bulky? Yes. Do they make your camera more of a video camera, more of a cinema camera? Totally. This will give you a lot more runtime, not only just in battery, but also eliminating that overheating. And then you have professional audio inputs digitally connected with the digital hot shoe, which is much needed. This brings it into that cinema realm. So here is the camera all stripped down. Let's talk about the video a little bit with what you get. Now for the first time ever, the Canon R5 II was the camera that introduced C-Log2 into its photography videography camera. 
Uh, C log two, if you're not familiar, gives you the most dynamic range. Now, Canon, not me, don't say that I'm the one making this up. Canon claims that it's 16 stops of dynamic range. Is it? I don't know. I'm not like a technical person. I'm geratific, not scientific. So from what I can see is you get a lot of stops, more stops than C log one, which is just C log. C log three. C log two is definitely more of a cinematic look. The dynamic range is good in the sky. The highlights are brought back a lot easier. The shadows, there's more detail. And in 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second, it just looks really good. Now, I'm just gonna jump ahead. Again, this is a brief overall three month experience with me. As you can see in videos that I've done in the past, and if you haven't seen them already, I do encourage them. I go into more detail, but at 60 frames per second, so anything above 30, it does get super soft. So it is not the sharpest image than you would get from the oversample 24 um, or even 30. The 60 is definitely softer unless and this is a big unless. When you shoot in RAW or SRAW, which is the 4K RAW, it is a lot sharper in 60 frames per second. And that's the only way I would suggest shooting in 60 frames per second is in SRAW or regular RAW. 8K RAW is fine. That's the regular RAW. That is good at 60 frames per second. You can always then downsample it to, uh, to 4K and it's going to be very sharp in that. But when you're manipulating it in raw. If you're using DaVinci Resolve, I have found it to be really good. I've actually decreased the sharpness in post in the raw format, and it looks really good. So much better than C-Log2. Now, C-Log2 is excellent if it's 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Anything above that, I would recommend doing it in raw. Oh, and I did want to touch on this. If you can't see it, this is the, uh, the Canon little cap for the digital hot shoe on top and everybody complains about it. And I think it's because they're just not used to it. This thing goes on actually pretty easily. What I like about it is it is weather sealed. A lot of the times you have that plastic one from all the other uh, previous models and it isn't weather sealed. Things just kind of get leaked in. This is rubber. There's a little gasket attached underneath and to get it off is actually easy. There is a button. I mean, it's a little thing and you do just push it down and then just slide it out. So it's not bad. A little bit of elbow grease, but anything that's supposed to be weather sealed, it shouldn't be easy to get off. And that's why I do like this. And I leave this on. Whereas my previous models, that plastic one, I would lose it and just leave it off. And then gunk would get into that digital hot shoe here this thing is much warranted. Now I have not owned the Canon R5. I was an R6, an R6 II user, an EOS R user. Um, so I couldn't tell you battery performance compared to the original R5, but the battery performance on this compared to the R6 and the R6 II is it sucks it dry. Now 45 megapixels you would imagine is going to suck your battery quite a bit compared to the 24 that you get from the R6 II. So that is definitely understandable. Again, the battery grip, love it. And just like the R6 II, you do have the dedicated video and photography button here on the left, which is good. Um, and then you got the little LED screen right here that you can utilize by looking at the specs. Your LCD screen is gonna be substantially larger than your R6 models. Um, it is noticeable. If you're coming from an R6, the screen is a lot bigger to the eye. Now back to video, the C-Log2 is awesome. You're shooting in 10-bit, and if you're shooting in RAW, it's gonna be 12-bit. And that 12-bit in color is a huge difference. When you're editing, you will see it. There is so much leverage and very, very, very little artifacting in those colors. Now in the 24 frames per second, 4K oversampled, you will get unlimited recording, even without that battery grip, unlimited recording. I did not have any issues. I know some people say they do. I don't know if it's the new firmware update that they did about a month in, but I'm good. Now for sure with this battery grip, no issues at all. 60 frames per second, you are looking at maybe 40, 45 minutes um, comfortably until it starts to get on the teetering of overheating. 
With this, I did not have any overheating at about an hour and 45 minutes. So if you're shooting 60 frames per second for an hour and 45 minutes, uh, maybe it's a wedding, maybe you want it. I hate shooting at 60. 60 is only used for slow motion, especially with real estate photography and videography when I'm doing those walkthroughs. That's where 60 frames per second comes in. That's fine, but I don't need that fan to do real estate because I'm only doing about 10 to 25 minutes at a time and it doesn't overheat. Now the autofocus on this might be amazing because it is back illuminated stacked sensor. It is getting a lot of details. Whereas here, let me jump into this real quick. You are getting very, very little rolling shutter. That is when you are either doing photography shooting or video and you are panning quick. It is reading the sensor down. And in most cameras, it cannot read it fast enough. And therefore the image looks slanted. If you're looking at a fence line, it might look like this. So it is not perfect. Now, when it is back illuminated stacked sensor, it is reading it a lot quicker. I'm not scientific by the way, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but it is reading it a lot quicker and you are not getting that banding and that rolling shutter issue, which makes this excellent for video, but also for sports photography. Is it perfect? No, the R1 is probably perfect, but this is very, very good when it comes to sports photography or wildlife. Now to talk about the photography side just a little bit, which I have not done many videos on it yet, which I want to, but this now does have the retina eye autofocus, not to be mistaken as eye autofocus. There's eye autofocus where the sensor is always focusing on the person's eye and knows where to focus. In this case, you are putting your eye right up to the viewfinder and it tracks your retina where you're looking and you can look anywhere and wherever you look is exactly where that focus point will be. Where this is game changing is weddings. In weddings, you are trying to photograph the groom or the bride, not me personally, I'm inanimate objects. I love architecture. But for you wedding photographers, you put your eye in there, you look at it, and there's no mincing words. That being said, you can actually put your top 10 people in there. You can program this to specific people and prioritize them. So if you have Bob and Jim and they're right by each other, you could put Bob above Jim. So if Jim gets in the way, it will still focus on Bob, even if you're not looking at it. So the cool thing about that prioritizing of the top 10 people is it is a specific order as well. It's not just putting those people in and it'll recognize it. It'll know who prioritizes over another. You can also jump around looking at the person you want to focus on in that group too. Even though it prioritizes over it, you can look specifically at somebody, click down, and then you've got that shot. Now this works with inanimate objects too. So you could be looking at a chair, focus perfectly on that. Then you can look over, not even adjusting this, look over at a table and get that table just perfectly too. Also with animals, you can get animals pinpointed by the way you look at them. So when you're looking at those huge zooms like the 100 to 500 or the 200 to 800, boy, it's game changing. Now I am a full-time architectural photographer that focuses on architecture and real estate. So is this perfect for those people? No, it, it, it's an overkill. 45 megapixels is an overkill. The R62 and the soon to be released R63 would be a better option. But for this very moment, 45 megapixels, I never thought I would enjoy it as much as I do. It is so sharp, it is so beautiful. The 8K, although I don't shoot it all the time, the 8K is, it's real. It's not something that's gimmicky. It looks good. It helps you change and post and crop down if you need to. If you are an R5 user, this is definitely an upgrade from the R5. If you're an R6 II user, well, it's an upgrade as well. But again, I think there's parallels when it comes to these models. The R6 III, I think is gonna, is gonna be like a mini R5 II. It should have a back illuminated stack sensor as well with little rolling shutter, 24 uh, megapixels. So it might actually read out even faster than the 45 megapixels 
which would make it even better. You know what will even be better? The R7 II, because it is a smaller sensor and it's gonna be also stacked, so I hear. And if that is the case, that would be the best APS-C video camera slash sports camera, wildlife camera that you probably could get. But for now, I could not go back to the R6 II after shooting this for a few weeks. And so I ended up selling my R6 II and I'm sorry, I have not missed my R6 II. It was an awesome camera. It's beautiful. It's great. It's wonderful. But the R5 II makes you forget it pretty easily. And so I moved on. This is my new lover right now. This could be your lover too. We can share her. I mean, you'll get your own, but you know what I mean. If the R6 II comes out first quarter, will I buy it? Uh, for the first time ever, it might be the time that I don't buy an R6 model. The R7 II should be announced next year, and that one I would buy. But for now, the R5 II is a lover above all lovers. Until I find another lover and then I dump her. If you enjoy me talking about gear like it's my lover, then you may wanna to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit that like button. And if you wanna see the gear that I use, it's in the link below. And if you wanna check out more videos, well, those are there.